And it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Royce Cumming. Royce is an entomologist from the USA with diverse knowledge on several insect-related fields. Royce's background in entomology encompasses uh, live butterfly exhibits, systematics, and taxonomy. He, is also, uh, he also has a master's degree in forensic entomology or the use of insects to help solve crimes. Royce is currently working on his PhD at the American Museum of Natural History, studying the evolutionary history of the Philidae or the uh, leaf insects. Royce has been passionate about entomology his whole life and especially entomology education uh, to help others see and appreciate the world of insects all around them. So everybody, let us all welcome Royce coming. Royce. All right, thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction. I'm uh, very happy to be here today. Thank you, thank you for accepting our invitation. A little bit, of course, yeah, I'm uh, very excited to share a little bit of my kind of niche uh, in entomology information with you all. It's a little bit out of the norm because most people think entomology and a majority of people who enter entomology end up in uh, pest management and uh, where a lot of the money is. So my fields that I enjoy are kind of the odd sets and it's going to be a little brief introduction to you uh, for you today of some of the oddball world of entomology that most people don't really know about. Let's get this going. So I'm just going to give a quick introduction about myself because I would much rather talk to you all about insects and uh, some of the amazing creatures that I'm going to be talking to you today about. But just to give a quick background, my background in entomology is actually a little bit out of the norm. My undergrad degree was actually in business administration. For the longest time, I've always enjoyed insects and wanted to keep it uh, more of a hobby and just keep it as something I could enjoy on the side. And uh, just to double check real quick, is everyone able to hear me all right? Yeah, I could hear you. Okay, perfect. Because uh, right now I'm actually back home at my family ranch mm -hmm. and we've had a storm come through and uh, it's a little, I think the internet might be a little slow. So if I do cut out at all in the next hour, please give a holler and let me know and uh, yeah, we can pause. We'll let you know. Thank you. Thank perfect. You. Thank you. So uh, one of the main reasons I love entomology is that through it, I'm able to connect with people all around the world uh, who through this one really massive passion with these little insects. Uh, thankfully, I was able to travel to Africa and Philippines at least once, and to Central America and all over uh, the United States, working with either inse other entomologists or insect related projects or uh, forensics, which we'll be talking about in the second half. But my two particular halves that I mostly revolve around are the forensic entomology and evolutionary biology re relating to systematics and taxonomy. So. First, I'm going to start off with the evolutionary biology half, um, because this has, we'll probably have a few less questions. Many people get very excited about the second half, the forensics, because everyone loves those forensics TV shows and murder mysteries, and uh, people generally have a lot of questions with that. So we'll end with that. Uh, but to introduce you to my evolutionary background, my particular organism of choice are the leaf insects, this fabulous camouflage organism that uh, very few people have actually seen before. They're difficult to find because of this beautiful camouflage. And uh, they're found throughout tropical Asia. And these are a couple of my favorite examples of just that amazing leaf mimicry. And the leaf insects come in all shapes and sizes and colors. Uh, on the left, we have one of the smallest species. That female is only about four centimeters long versus one of the largest species of leaf insect. And that's a Pulcrophyllum giganteum which is almost 12 centimeters long, a really massive leaf insect that was only des uh, described in 1984. So this massive insect that uh, is very little known. Uh, in fact, out in Micronesia, one of the largest insects uh, in the country is actually a leaf insect of which we've only ever found four specimens. So incredibly hard to find, very rare, but beautiful insects. And on the right here, we have three species that uh, were all raised under the same conditions, same host plant, but you have living, draw, uh, dying, and dead leaves. So really fabulous camouflage. And not only do they look like leaves, 
but they will also sway when they walk like leaves in the wind and they have the same texture and coloration of leaves. That's a really fabulous little organism that I've loved for many years and have decided to uh, pursue as a actual PhD degree. So not only do the adult insects look like leaves and move like leaves, but also their eggs very often look like seeds. Uh, really, really fabulous morphology in the eggs. And we've actually been finding that as we review more species of eggs, um, you can actually almost identify the species of the insect based on their egg, very unique egg morphology. And this is actually one of the big mysteries that we're working on, on right now is uh, how is it that evolution is acting on these eggs and creating such a unique morphology when it's really an uh, inert feature. It's not walking around, it's not uh, out in the canopy. Usually they're down in the soil and uh, out of view and up amongst the ferns and moss. So very, very unique little insects and I've been drawn to them for years. So with that quick introduction to leaf insects, how many do you see in this picture? Now I'm gonna give you maybe about 20 seconds if you uh, can spot as many as you can. So I'll give you a hint. There's more than one and there's less than 200. If you say 200, you're counting leaves, not leaf insects. All right, so here is your answer in three, two, one. Did you spot all nine? So we have several adults, a very large gigantium, a beautiful red tobolowens, many nymphs, and even a male leaf insect. So very difficult to find in their beautiful canopy habitat. Not only do they look like leaves and sway like leaves, but they're the same thickness as leaves so that as light is passing through the leaves, it also passes through the leaf insect and they blend right in. Their camouflage, uh, depending on the species, has been really perfected. This is one of my favorite images of just showing how beautiful that uh, venation is. This was a new genus and species that we just described a couple months ago. And uh, one of my favorite pictures of leaf insects showing just the beautiful parallel between the venation and the leaves and the venation and the le uh, leaf insects. But because they're so perfectly camouflaged, they're really in uh, incredibly difficult to find. And because they live in the canopies, um, as soon as they uh, hatch, they'll run to the nearest tree they can, and they will run up that tree, and they will spend their entire lives in the canopy. So it's very rare that they're found more often than not. Uh, one of the best chances to find them is actually after a storm passes through. Once a gust of wind or a heavy storm comes through, it'll actually knock them sometimes out of the canopy. Uh, if you do a nice nature hike the day after a storm, that's when you're most likely to be finding leaf insects. This is a beautiful gigantium that uh, was knocked out of a storm from the night before. So, and leaf insects can be found from sea level up to uh, pretty impressive elevations. Uh, these yellow or this green outline is showing the range of our modern leaf insects where they can be found. The uh, stars there are some of the highest elevation points that we have found leaf insects at. They actually can range for several thousand meter elevation, uh, including in Luzon. There, northern Luzon, there's a couple of very small species which are found uh, above 2,000 meter elevation, way up in the cooler forests. Really a neat little insect. But because most of these species are pretty poorly known and very rarely collected, we still have a very basic knowledge about many of the species. Uh, for what is currently known as far as taxonomy, we only really know a lot of information about a third of them. Uh, these species are popular pets, uh, they're bred, they're sold as you know, uh, nice art pieces or to museums or collectors. For a majority of the insects, most museums around the world only have a couple. And for about of the third of the species, we only know of a single specimen that represents that species in collections. So because they're so rare, uh, I'm gonna actually give a little quick pitch here in a sec uh, about iNaturalist, which is a amazing naturalist site where I am on it every day looking to see if anyone uploads uh, insect or leaf insect images because every time someone adds a new species, um, I'm either adding new dis distribution points to our maps or every now and then we do find new species that uh, someone has found in iNaturalist. So every museum that I go to, we generally find uh, an either a new species or several new species in their collections. And they've been sitting there for decades or centuries in some cases. 
And just in the last 20 years, the amount of species within the leaf insects has actually exploded. Up until about the 1990s, uh, most museums only had a couple of speci specimens or they were just sitting neglected in a drawer somewhere and no one had really worked on their taxonomy. And the general consensus was that they're not a very diverse group. They're, they were just assumed to be a couple species with very large distributions across Asia. What we're now finding is quite the opposite. Instead, almost every single island has a uh, different species on it. And even in Vietnam, our paper we just had on the cryptophyllium, almost every mountaintop has a new and completely unique species from the uh, other surrounding areas. So our diversity is starting to explode and we just passed uh, 100 described species recently. One other challenge that makes them a little bit difficult to work with is the sexual dimorphism, meaning the males, which we have here on the left, look completely different than the females like we have here on the right. So if you do collect a single male specimen or female, it's a little bit difficult to match them up if you don't have a DNA to work with or if you didn't catch them live and were able to raise a next generation. So that's brought up a couple of issues over the years. Uh, one that we just recently worked on was where are the lady nanophyllium? Uh, the nanophyllium were described in 1906, uh, so well over 100 years ago, and up until recently, they were only known from males. Uh, they're a little very small insect, hence the name nanophyllium. And um, up until 2020, we did not have any solid answer as to which the females were. That is until we received eggs from a Phyllium asikiens from Papua New Guinea, and we were able to rear them in the Montreal Insectarium. And lo and behold, uh, out came a couple male nanophyllium and several females of supposedly a different genus. But uh, so we had finally, after over 100 years, been able to match up these males and females. And our work even made it into the New York Times, which we were pretty excited about. I think our catchy title, The Lost Lovers Linked at Long Last, was uh, what, what caught the author's eye and uh, we landed us there. But then we still have a couple issues. So now we know that the females were part of the frondosum group. So now we finally know males and females, but which goes with which? Uh, unfortunately, that is a bit difficult of a uh, question because Many of our male specimens are antique specimens, they're over 100 years old. Uh, I think for four of these six cases, these are only known from a single specimen in a museum. And I think for these top two, we only know of two specimens. So very rarely do we find specimens. And in many cases, these are too old to use DNA to match up the males and females. So bit by bit, we're unraveling these mysteries and starting to clarify things. And in this case, match up our males and females and really understand the true diversity in New Guinea. But speaking of molecular, uh, with our DNA work, uh, we've been working on this for the last uh, maybe five or so years now. These are some of my colleagues who've been instrumental in this work. Uh, working with these big data sets, we are now up to about 70% of the described leaf insects we've been able to molecularly sample. And bit by bit, this is really opening up the door for bigger evolutionary questions. So unfortunately, there is still a good chunk of species that we have not yet been able to track down and get a DNA sample for. But bit by bit, we're working through that. So this brings me to our point of our topic today for the leaf insects in the Philippines. In the Philippines, there are four genera. There's the very small pseudomicrophyllium and microphyllium. And then the much larger and uh, more, diver uh, more widespread and diverse phylum in the Philippines. And just recently, uh, we've realized there was also cryptophyllium. This is a genus we just described a couple months ago. And the reason we know about it is because someone posted on iNaturalist. That's the first time we've seen this genus in the Philippines. And I'm going to touch on them in a little bit. But the Philippines are really incredibly diverse, especially to have four different genera and uh, many, many species. So just to give you introduction to what we're now able to answer with these uh, large molecular data sets, we can go through, and this is a, a table just showing you the different loci, the, the DNA loci that we've been able to sequence across many of the species. Unfortunately, we're still missing a number of them, but now we can use this in, uh, DNA data to recreate the evolutionary history based on this information. 
So this is just a brief run through the leaf insects of the Philippines and what we've been able to identify and uh, learn from their molecular uh, analyses so far. So generally, uh, looking across all the different analyses that uh, have been published by the individuals in our particular group, it looks like the age of the extant leaf insects, the ones that are alive now, appears to be around 50 million years. And it looks as though our origin is probably the Papua New Guinea, uh, Australia, Indonesia area is most likely where this particular group of insects originated and likely had a jump dispersal up to Borneo and uh, mainland Asia. Now, you'll notice there are no Philippine leaf insects for a big reason, and that is there is no Philippines yet. This is 50 million years ago. Luzon has uh, yet to emerge. It's only to about 45 million years when uh, Luzon starts to emerge off the coast of Borneo, and we don't have any evidence of dispersal of leaf insects yet, but as you move through time, it appears about 42 million years ago or so, there was one lineage that left Borneo and made the jump onto Luzon back when Luzon was relatively close to the Bornean coast. And then pass through time, if you notice this blue bar here is our timeline corresponding to the map, and if you watch the map, It'll be shifting as the plate tectonics move. So as we move through time, about 35 million years ago, Luzon starts to shift away from Borneo, at which point we don't have any evidence of other additional leaf insect dispersals to Philippines, likely because it's getting farther away from Borneo at this point. But as we move through time, the clade that did make it to Luzon, the microphylium and the pseudomicrophylium, they began to diversify. We ended up with two different genera and the different species. And it looks like as though some of these species might have diversified across elevation gradients. Uh, in this case, uh, the microphylium and some of the pseudomicrophylium are typically a high elevation species versus gurion, which is actually a low elevation species. So there is a diversification there on Luzon. And eventually, the other leaf insects, the phylum, will be making their way over and starting to diversify through time. And if you note here, Palawan is making its way from the north to the south. It's not yet near the Philippines. But as it starts to get closer to Borneo, we're going to get to a point in time where several different species on Borneo also diversified out to Palawan. And Palawan is a really fabulous uh, distribution zone at, from Borneo to the Philippines. And we're going to talk about distributions in just a moment. But throughout these last couple of million years, there's been a diversity of leaf insects uh, emerging across the Philippines and actually reaching it from several different locations. So one of the reasons the diversity of leaf insects is so high in the Philippines is most likely to the Pleistocene Aggregate Island Complex, or PAIC, which the Pleistocene was one of the most recent periods where the Earth was going through periods of cool and warm, where the as the temperatures shifted throughout the last two and a half million years, so did the, uh, the amount of water in the oceans. So as you go from glacial to interglacial, the sea level is actually rising and falling with each of these periods, which for most of the world just adds a little bit of coastline. It's not too significant, but for the island nations of Asia, it means a vast difference in uh, connectivity of islands and the shapes of these regions. So during the last two and a half million years, due to the shallow seas, every time the sea level would rise and fall, islands would be connected and then separated. And so would the populations of all the animals on these islands that either be able to intersperse and uh, move to different areas, and then they would be cut off and they would be able to diversify at those points. And there's been lots of really cool studies uh, looking at these island aggregate complexes. So they've been done across birds, reptiles, amphibians, and a number of insects. And it looks like many of our leaf insects do somewhat follow these trends. So you can see the modern outline in black, but then the colored outlines would have been when the sea levels dropped and these islands were connected and then subsequently broken apart several times. Another thing really interesting that we can learn from looking across the evolutionary phylogeny of these insects is once we look at a large family scale across all species, 
We can then also backtrack through time and look at possible routes of colonization. For the leaf insects, it looks as though there was two main routes or three main routes of colonization, two coming from Borneo uh, through Palawan and the Sulu Archipelago, and then another one through the Sangihe Islands uh, coming up from Sulawesi. So this really makes a very interesting evolutionary history of species in the Philippines. And bit by bit, as we are able to sequence more specimens and kind of fill out our, our history of these insects, do we unravel many more of these mysteries. So to wrap up the first portion of our leaf insect, our talk this evening, whenever I'm talking about leaf insects, I always get asked, so I'm sure someone's gonna ask this later, but uh, what is my favorite species? And there's so many to choose from. There's some incredibly rare ones and beautiful colors and amazing shapes. But one of my favorites would actually be Exectum. And this particular species, as I've always been very drawn to because it has some really unique features that we don't see in any other leaf insects. Uh, one of my favorite features of this are the really incredibly lobed abdomen which must be mimicking some kind of very lobed leaf. Um, we have yet to identify any possible host plants. Also, it has some really incredible genitalia, which don't match up with anything else we know of. So very cool little insect that, uh, unfortunately, we only know of one. This, uh, this single specimen is in the British Museum, and it was collected over 100 years ago from the Huan Peninsula. Um, the reason that Huan Peninsula is mostly known for is that was actually the landing site of the 9th Australian Division during World War II. So whenever you Google the Huan Peninsula and in particular the Rawlinson Range, uh, when you're trying to find information on this insect, there's not much out there, but there is plenty about the habitat. Um, when you look up the habitat of this particular area, you get a lot of war photos, unfortunately. So hopefully someday we will find this species again and uh, be able to learn more about it and actually figure out where it falls into this weird evolutionary history of the leaf insects. But I have been able to go see this specimen in person when I was working in the British Museum one day. Uh, really amazing little specimen, cool thorax. And what really is neat about this is the uh, long genitalia on this specimen, because the females, the shape of their genitalia, the subgenital plate and the gonopophyses those actually kind of correspond to the shape of the egg. So if one feature is longer and one's shorter and vice versa, that can actually indicate the shape of the egg before they flick it away. And we have no idea what the eggs would look like in this particular species because the genitalia are so unique. So hopefully one day we'll be able to find some of these live and uh, take a look at their amazing eggs and learn more about them, but fabulous little species. So that wraps up the first portion here about the leaf insects and uh, particular the leaf insects of the Philippines. Next, we're going to completely transition to a very different topic of entomology. Uh, this is what my master's work is in, and I regularly do uh, teaching and casework here in California uh, for different departments. So typically, when I start off with a talk like this, I have to give a disclaimer because Typically in these presentations, I am talking to uh, police departments and we're giving full trainings. And um, because of the nature of forensic entomology, it is generally of a graphic nature because we're, we're, we are working with death and decomposition. But today I decided uh, best to make it a fun for the whole family. So I've, I've taken out much of the graphic images and um, I've just kept the science for you today. I also wanted to be mindful of any uh, cultural differences between myself working with uh, police departments versus anyone who might be tuning in from the rest of the world today. I want to make sure that this was open and uh, enjoyable for all. So what is forensic entomology? And I usually, as soon as I present that I'm a forensic entomologist to people, people often ask like, oh, so you learn how bugs die. And that's not typically the case. Uh, more often, we're not solving insect murders. We're actually solving uh, murders of people instead. And we are using insects as evidence to help solve these murders and bring justice to these cases. So why use insect evidence? And people ask that all the time. They say, oh, well, we have ballistics, and we have fingerprints, and we have uh, you know hair, and we have fibers, and 
we've got all kinds of other information. Why are insects also exciting? Insects are just gross. We should uh, flush them down the drain. We don't want to deal with them. But I say once you've learned about all the different questions we can answer with entomology, um, people's uh, idea of them seems to very turn around and people are much very amazed by all we can learn. So one of the main reasons that we're so interested in insects within forensic entomology is that insects are generally the very first to discover a corpse. Uh, in the case of death, as your body chemistry starts to change, uh, different volatiles, uh, different chemicals are released from your body. And in the case of outdoor or warm cases, as soon as those chemicals start to uh, waft away from the body, the insects that are forensically significant, the ones that we'll, we'll be working with today, uh, they have chemoreceptors behind their antenna, which are incredibly fine-tuned to be smelling for that death, um, because it's a ephemeral resource, meaning it's a resource that does not stick around for very long. It is uh, something that must be located quickly and utilized quickly. So also, insects arrive in a somewhat predictable order, and we're going to talk about insect specificity here in just a minute. Uh, but because insects are so specific on what they'll eat or where they'll live, uh, that can add a lot of information to cases. Also, pathologists, the people who are generally working with corpse and uh, coroners, they're really good at determining when an individual has been dead for a couple hours or up to a day. But beyond that, uh, the body is too degraded to be able to use a pathologist. Generally, pathologists are looking at things such as algor mortis, liver mortis, or rigor mortis, which are the physical changes in the body, like uh, a change in temperature, uh, stiffening of the muscles, or the pooling of blood uh, as it stops circulating through the body. And so those changes happen very early on. That's in the early post-mortem interval. And what I mean by post-mortem interval is the time since death, which more often than not is what we mostly get called in to, uh, to try to learn and to present for a case is how long has someone been dead? So post-mortem interval very early on, the pathologist is really good for a couple hours to a day or so. On the complete other end of the spectrum, if you have the anthropologist, so let's say someone's been dead for five or six years and all you have left is bones. At that point, uh, the anthropologist can get called in and they can be incredibly helpful for a case. But more often than not, the entomologist, we fall in that middle ground. Uh, the bodies we work with are generally highly decomposed, uh, actively in decay with lots of insect activity and um, not the pretty bodies and not the pretty bones. This is the, the kind of squeamish area where many people turn up their nose and that's why they usually ignore the insect evidence is it's a it takes a lot of getting used to and it's it's not for everybody i guarantee you so just to give you a quick overview of uh, death in general you have a uh, fresh bloat which at which point the different mi microbes in the body are releasing gases and the body start to balloon out you have active decay advanced decay, and finally, dry remains and skeletonization. So if you look across these different stages of death, that's a very different resource at each time. It's a different uh, chemicals, different food source, different amount of moisture, and therefore different insects are interested in it at different times. So just to introduce insects as specialists, here's a couple of my favorite insect specialists because Different species prefer different food sources, different environments, or different times of the year. So what we have here on our left, one of my absolute favorite specialists. These are the griloblata. This is a called a ice crawler. This particular group of insects, they only live at extremely high elevations, and they only live at the edge of snowpack. So the reason they live there is that as dusk and uh, night comes along, these insects will wake up and they'll crawl out from under their hiding places and they will actually walk out on the ice in the evening and they will find the frozen corpses of insects that died during the day and they will feed on those frozen corpses. So the reason they're able to do this is actually have a little bit of antifreeze in their exoskeleton. They're able to survive walking on the ice where most insects uh, freeze to death and become their meal. So a very weird little insect with a very unique and uh, restricted area. Also, of course, the dung beetles are uh, very often generalists, but there are some very cool specialists. Uh, obviously, 
omnivores versus herbivores versus carnivores will have very different poop. And therefore, the dung beetles, you might have different species that are specialized on different mammals or different feeders. And so there's a, a very unique range of specialists within these. And of course, we just started off with our leaf insects a little bit ago, specializing in uh, diversity of leaf camouflage from the texture to the color to the shape and the movement. So to jump into our forensically significant insects, these are more often than not flies. And the two most common species that we generally work with as forensic entomologists are the blowflies on the left and the flesh flies on the right. And these are very common flies. You'll see these you know, sometimes uh, flying around uh, dog poop or flying around a house, uh, bouncing in the windows, trying to get off. Or very often, you'll find them uh, sitting on flowers. Uh, these are will be adults will be feeding on nectar and uh, flying around. But of course, if you leave any meat outside, as that meat starts to degrade, the insects will smell it and they will come running because their young, the maggots, are incredibly picky eaters. And these female uh, flies are incredibly good mothers. They know their picky eater children need to have that perfect meat meal. So they will sense it out and they will come running. So. One of the big differences between these two groups of flies is the blow flies on the left here. As you can see, this is actually several egg masses. Those are several hundred eggs uh, that, that are already laid on this individual versus the flesh flies, which will actually give live birth. They will uh, give birth to maggots, which can immediately start feeding on resources. So in a warm environment outdoors, you might have maggots on a corpse almost immediately. So which is one of the main reasons why Forensic entomology, uh, these insects are very important and can help us solve cases. On the other end of the spectrum, as that body starts to dry out and get a little bit older, you have different species that will come to feed on it. Um, here on the left, we have a couple of different uh, beetle species like the hide beetles and skin beetles. These ones will feed on drier remains like uh, dried skin or hair or clothing or fingernails versus the ones on the right here, these two, these are some of my favorite flies. Not as common as those first ones we came across, but uh, in particular the fanity, these flies, you generally find these on uh, wetter remains, either uh, a body in, a, in water or in a very swampy area. And the reason, if you look at the maggots, they have these little frills on the side. And those little frills actually act as somewhat of pontoons. So although you'll come across you know, some of the worst bodies you'll ever see, uh, these little cute maggots are kind of scooting around the top of the, uh, the corpse. So horrid, but you have to look for the bright side in uh, everything every now and then to keep yourself sane. And of course, these ones always, everyone gets a kick out of these. These are the cheese skippers. Now, whenever I'm teaching my courses, I always tell the investigators, whenever you first approach a body, never open your mouth when you're coming near it and always wear eye protection. And that's because of the cheese skippers. Uh, when startled, their maggots uh, will actually curl up into a little ball and they will shoot themselves and spring several feet through the air. So if you lean over a body and cast your shadow, every now and then you might have maggots come flying past your face. So keep your mouth shut and your uh, eyes protected because these little maggots can fly far. But the reason they're called cheese skippers is because in Europe, there is a delicacy called queso marzu, where some crazy Europeans take a perfectly good wheel of cheese, they add maggots, they let the maggots feed in the cheese, poop in the cheese, and die in the cheese for several months, and then a crazy European eats the cheese. I've been told it is one of the most potent cheeses you can try. Um, I've also been told that you will then smell and sweat like stinky cheese for several days and the taste takes a long time to leave your mouth. So I have not tried it yet and actually it's banned across most of the world due to health reasons, but uh, every now and then you can find it. So if anyone ever offers you queso marzu, now you know. The, the more you know is always good, right? So now that we've been introduced a little bit into what insects are involved, Let's go through and I'll show you more or less how we use them and are able to help solve investigations. So there's two main ways. The first is insect succession and the second and more commonly used is growth and development. 
So remember back to that first slide I showed you of the, uh, the stages of death. In this case, as that body changes, so does the community structure of insects. As that resource changes, the different insects that are interested in it will also change along with it. So if you know the community of insects very well, you're then able to uh, more or less create a window of time when you expect how old the body's been exposed. So it works something like this. If you have a body is located and you collect a certain assortment of species, you've collected a snapshot in time. And then you want to figure out, OK, how long is it most likely that these insects have been act active on the body? So it works something like this. In this case, we have uh, the vial collected three different species, F, A, and D. And if you have a data table, you can then mark those across. And then you're going to look for overlap. So in this case, you would expect to find all three species uh, at least four days and at a maximum of six days. And in this case, it gives you a time frame of a uh, window of when you would have expected to find these particular species and gives you a little bit of a time frame of how long this individual might have been dead. Unfortunately, there's caveats with this. Obviously, if you want to use this, you have to know the entire community. You have to know the species in the area. You have to know how they interact and you have to know how they fluctuate through the seasons. So unfortunately, there are very few forensic entomologists out there. Um, the only case you might be able to use this would be if you had a body in a forensic entomologist's backyard, because they would be innately knowledgeable of the insects in their area and be able to do something like this. Instead, mostly what we work with is growth and development. And I just want to clarify the difference between these two. Growth is just a change of size, typically. And stages of development are uh, more unique uh, changes through time. So for the blowflies, we have several stages of life. Uh, you start off with the eggs. You have a first, second, and third instar maggot, followed by the pupa, and then later adult emergence. So in this case, you have these stages of life, the development. And within each of those stages, you'd have growth. So whenever I present this to the forensic investigators, everyone starts getting all excited and they go, oh, cool, you know, this is, you know, so if I find a big maggot, I'll know this, this many hours old. And I say, well, just like everything in biology, it depends. Uh, unfortunately, insects are poikilothermic, which means they're cold-blooded, which means they don't measure their lives in the same way you and I do. So us as mammals, we measure our lives in absolute time, such as, days, months, years. Instead, insects measure their lives in thermal units or energy. So because temperature equals energy, the warmer the temperatures and the longer they've been alive in these warmer temperatures actually influences how old they are per se. So insects measure their lives in physiological time or thermal units. So for us, we are homeotherms uh, as mammals. We have an internal constant body temperature, so we always develop at a continuous rate. Therefore, we're able to measure our lives in days, months, years. Like for example, today I am 9,855 days old. But insects, it's a little more complicated. In this instance, as the temperature adjusts, the insects are developing at different rates. So if you have three different individuals raised at different temperatures and different time schemes, you can end up with different accumulated degree hours uh, depending on the temperature and how long. So my advice to everyone is if you have insects as pets at home and you want to keep them alive longer, uh, lower the temperature a little bit. Uh, that'll actually extend their life because you are influencing how many thermal units they're experiencing and developing under. So step one, let's say you are called in as a forensic entomologist and the investigators want to know how long has someone been deceased for? So your first step is you want to identify the species. Uh, as I mentioned, with that specificity of insects, different species will develop at different rates uh, and be found in different areas. So as soon as you identify the particular species, you can move on. This is very important because if you identify the wrong species, which sometimes it can be kind of difficult, um, that can very much influence how quickly or slowly a species develops under different te temperature regimes. So once you know what species you're working with, you can then hopefully find development data tables. So for most of the common species, 
in areas where this is very popularly used, you can find these development tables. So if you look to the left here, you have your different life stages, your first, second, and third in star, uh, followed by prepupa, pupa, and adult emergence. So if you say, oh, I found Lucilia sericata at a crime scene, and the scene was about 20 degrees Celsius, this can give you a range of how many thermal units those insects had to develop under to reach particular life stages. So it looks something like this. As you're going through time, you have the coolest part of the evening, rising up to the hottest point in your afternoon, and then cooling back down at night. And during that time, the insects are going to be developing, and you want to know the amount of thermal units that they experienced throughout that day. And as you add those up, you're able to estimate the age of an insect. So let's put some of that to use. We've introduced you briefly to forensic entomology. Let's run through some different case examples and uh, see how many we're able to answer with insects. So I always pose this question when I'm teaching the classes to for, uh, the forensic investigators. I say, when a body is found, what questions must be answered? And I'm saying, all and every questions. And typically the main ones that come up are, who is the individual? How long are they, have they been dead? How did they die? And has the body been moved? They wanna know all these different instances of uh, big questions, which are incredibly important for cases, which let's see if we can answer some of those with insects. So first case we're gonna go through is, how long has someone been deceased? And this was a case I was working on a couple of years ago where we actually received a lot of insect evidence. The, uh, the people who collected the evidence for us and sent it to us had actually taken a forensic entomology course and they realized how important insects were. So they did a great job of collecting insect evidence for us. And they sent us a lot of stuff, including this particular fly in the top, which is interesting because if you notice the wings, they don't look like a normal fly wing here. Uh, this is because this fly just emerged from its pupa. Therefore, the wings have not fully developed yet. They haven't had time to fully expand, which means we're looking for adult emergence at 440 accumulated degrees. So we had the individuals were collected when the body was found on May 16th. And then we have to work backwards through time to find a point when uh, the insect experienced at least 440 accumulated degree hours. So in this particular case, uh, this individual had been exposed for quite a while. They had been sitting there through all of May, all of April, and we're looking at this final column here. Backing through time, we've got 200s, 300s, and finally 400s. It had to have been at least since March 25th. So in this case, we needed at least a month and a half, almost two months for these insects to have been developing to reach the stage where this fly would have emerged. Additionally, we found a couple other species at the scene, including third instar Creophilus maxillosus, which are the maggot tigers. These are a big uh, predator. They will actually feed on maggots as well as sometimes uh, the corpse, but mostly they're, they're there to eat the uh, little gummy, protein-packed gummy snacks that are maggots. They are not gonna run away, uh, easy pickings. So if you look through the timeline, we had uh, May 16th, May 17th, when the individual had been discovered and our evidence was collected. And then we looked through the thermal units and we backtracked through time to when the flies most likely colonized. And then a, there was a discrepancy between when the, uh, the other insects uh, likely arrived, which these are maggot predators. So it does make sense a little bit that uh, it would have taken a couple days before there would have been enough maggots on the individual uh, for these other insects to have then arrived as well. So this gives us a nice window of time frame between most likely this individual had been exposed and how long they had been dead for. So move on to, so we just answered how long someone had been deceased. What about, um, has a body been moved? Where did they come from? So this is a hypothetical case here in Los Angeles County. This is here in California. And this is actually where I did my master's thesis. Uh, across LA County. So let's say we find a decedent up here in the San Gabriel Mountains. And something really unique about Los Angeles County, and the reason I chose it to do my master's thesis, is there's four main ecoregions for Los Angeles County. We have the Mojave Desert, which is a high elevation, very dry, limited rainfall. We have the interior mountain range, the San Gabriel Mountains, which are very high elevation, snow at certain times of the year, 
uh, really beautiful. It was, it was lovely driving up there every few weeks to set these traps. Also, we have the coastal mountains, which receive a nice, cool, uh, and very moist environment compared to the rest of LA. And then, of course, we have massive urban sprawl. This area D is lower elevation, highly urbanized, and very different from all the rest. So when we collected insect evidence off of our decedent, we can look at the community composition. We say, OK, we found uh, this percentage of this species and this species and such and so forth. And that gives you a snapshot of what was on that individual. And then we can compare that with what we know about the different ecoregions of Los Angeles County. So remember, we found our individual here in San Gabriel Mountains. These community compositions highly differ. Things are not adding up. It looks like this individual had been brought from somewhere else. So compare what was found on the individual with the other ecoregions. Because we don't know where this individual came from. We want to use the insects to solve that. So in this particular case, it looks as though uh, the Mojave Desert was one of the areas where insect activity most likely corresponds to what species were found on this decedent. So very drastically different insect communities, and in this case helped us then look outside the San Gabriel Mountains and point us in one direction or the other. Uh, obviously, there's several million people down here in Los Angeles Basin, uh, a lot fewer leads out here in uh, the Lancaster area. That's mostly desert and uh, a lot easier to hunt down and track leads in that case. All right, so another case here. So getting away from how long someone has been dead and has been someone been moved, this was actually a case that I worked on when I was doing my master's out in Indiana. Uh, this picture is a little deceiving. This was actually a pretty steep incline. Uh, and in this particular case, this was an FBI case where they had called in my mentor uh, as a forensic entomologist to help investigate on the scene. So the uh, particular individual, their bones had been scattered down this hillside. And the reason they were able to identify them very easily was the individual had just had double hip replacements uh, several years before when they went missing. And every time a, a hip replacement is done, many medical pieces have a serial number on them. So in this particular case, once they located her double hip replacements, they were very easily able to identify the individual. So when the FBI called us up, they said, hey, this individual had disappeared two years prior, and we're wondering, did she decompose here? Uh, they believe that they had done a very thorough job of searching for her when she had disappeared two years before, and they were thinking, hey, maybe after we had searched, someone brought her bones and they dumped her bones here. So they wanted us to first look and see if there's any insect evidence to help search for that. So there we were, that's uh, myself in the back, uh, Dr. Neil Haskell, the maggot man, and uh, another one of our master's students and one of our local sheriffs. And we spent the whole afternoon clamoring up and down that hillside uh, looking for insect evidence. So remember at this point, this was two years after, uh, she has been fully skeletonized. There are no active live insects at this point. There is just bones, but there were puparia left behind. So if you remember back to that life cycle of the blowflies I showed you earlier, you have the egg, the maggots, and then the puparia. Once the adult fly is ready to emerge and fly off, it'll leave this puparia behind in the soil. So in this particular case, we were uh, sifting through the soil and we did find many, many blowfly puparia, which sometimes you can identify the species um, based on the puparia. And in this particular case, we were able to identify it to a particular species that was active in the fall when she did go missing. So it looks like, yes, these flies were in this area in a heavy concentration at about the right time of year. So this does add up. So the reason I bring up the years don't matter in this case is because there was a case out in, uh, I believe, the Midwest where they'd found a bunch of bison uh, carcasses and they were wondering, oh, hey, you know, was this a mass poaching event when they were doing, they were doing an excavation and found these? Or uh, what, what was the deal with these? So inside the skulls, they found a whole bunch of these puparia. So when they contacted a forensic entomologist, the entomologist was able to look at these and identify, oh yes, these were uh, springtime species. Um, this looks like it happened in the springtime, but I can't tell you what year because there's no live insects. 
Well, when they did radiocarbon dating on the hair and tissues of these uh, carcasses, they actually found they were 1400 years old. So the forensic entomologists couldn't tell you what year, but they could tell you it was springtime 1400 years ago. So that brings us back to our modern case. In this particular instance, we had the puparia and we were able to say, yes, something did decompose here, but we didn't know for how long, we just knew about the seasons added up. But there was something else really exciting about these puparia. In this particular case, if you uh, take a empty pu fly puparia and you run it through a mass spectrometer, you get a particular spectra of chemicals that are present. Now, something interesting with insects is as they're feeding on something, they don't break down to toxins or chemicals the same way you and I do. Sometimes the insects will actually sequester those, in those chemicals into their exoskeleton. So in this particular case, when we run the puparia through the mass spectrometer, we find the typical fly puparia, but also we found a couple mystery chemicals. And in this particular case, that added up to ethylene glycol, which for most of you in the tropics, I don't think this is very common because this is actually antifreeze. Uh, this is what many people in the Midwest use in their vehicles to keep them from freezing over in the winter. But unfortunately, ethylene glycol is very toxic. So it looks as though um, whatever these, these maggots had been feeding on had a great deal of ethylene glycol in their system. And as they were feeding, they were sequestering those toxins into their exoskeleton. And very conveni conveniently, those exoskeletons were there for us to uh, locate and use in this investigation later. And to wrap up the last couple cases here before we break for questions, um, there, in the absence of a body, if you still have insect evidence around, there's still a lot that you can do. Uh, in this particular case, this was a truck bed. Uh, the individual uh, was much suspected as being the possible perpetrator of this murder. And when they were pulled over by the police, the police noticed a whole bunch of maggots crawling around in the back of the truck. And the individual said, oh, no, 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 that was, you know, I had a, a dead deer back there. I was going to do some hunting and I forgot about it. And those are just maggots from the deer. Well, something very interesting about maggots is that they actually have a crop. So the crop is an area behind the mouth hooks that actually stores undigested material before it goes into the stomach of the maggot. So in this case, uh, there was plenty of these maggots crawling around the, tr the truck bed. They were able to extract the material from the crops of these maggots and sequence it and identify it as, no, this was not deer. In this particular case, this was the uh, missing individual. So this was uh, maggots from someone who had been in the back of the truck bed. Also, uh, this over here, I usually make the investigators guess and see if anyone can get that right, but that is a pubic louse, uh, very, very small, but they also have a crop. So if they are feeding on an individual and uh, someone comes in close contact with them, they can transfer pubic lice between individuals. So if you don't have a bot or if you have a potential, if you have a victim and they have pubic lice, one thing I always recommend is to sequence the, uh, the material inside the crop of the pubic louse, because obviously you know your victim, you have the victim there with you, you have their DNA standard, but oftentimes in that pubic louse, you will find a mixture of several people that then that louse has been feeding on. And that can be a, a very good idea to search for a prime suspect, or at least people who have been intimately close with this individual before they passed away. So DNA is everywhere, and these little insects are great vessels for holding DNA for us to uh, then later use, or other chemicals in case, some cases. And the last case I'm going to bring here for you today about uh, just a quick introduction to forensic entomology is one of my favorites. This is a very oddball case uh, where insects were used in a unique way. So this individual here is Vincent Brothers. Uh, he was an abusive husband who had um, just flown out to Chicago for the weekend. He wanted to stay out there with his brother. While he was gone, his wife, his three children, and his mother-in-law were murdered in their home. So as the uh, abusive husband, he was automatically suspect number one. But when confronted about this particular murder, he says, oh, no, 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 I flew out to Chicago last week. I was out there with my brother and we drove around Chicago for a you know, couple of days. Well, 
Thankfully, the investigators who were working on this case immediately called up the car company and found the vehicle that he had been using. And when they look at the speedometer, obviously uh, there was several thousand miles on that speedometer. So his defense was, we drove several thousand miles around the East Coast. We never drove to California and back. Well, one other thing they did with the car is they actually took the grill off the car and looked at the intake. So in this particular instance, what happens as you're driving cross country is you hit lots of different insects. And as those insects start to pile up on the front of your car, that's collecting evidence. Uh, lots and lots of amazing insects were smashed onto the front of that car and were very helpful in this case. In particular, one of the main pieces of evidence was the leg from a red shanked grasshopper. In this particular case, the red shanked grasshopper is only found on the western half of the United States, uh, where his defense was, oh, we just drove around the Midwest for a couple thousand miles, when in fact, the numbers of insects and the species that were found, remember that specificity? Well, different species along the route were identified and were able to help uh, bring justice to this case. So almost got away with five counts of murder, but uh, saved by a grasshopper. So once again, insects brought justice to uh, this particular case. So just to wrap up forensic entomology for you, more often than not, probably about 90% of what cases we work on are estimating a minimum post-mortem interval. How long has someone been dead? But there's a number of other things we can do, such as victim identification in absence of a body, such as the insects holding DNA for us, uh, presence of drugs or poisons used by the victim, because the insects will sequester that, uh, an estimated time between death or burial or burning, presence of chemicals on a body, and also movement of body following death. So insects, they're absolutely everywhere, really fabulous little insect uh, creatures with sometimes very specific lifestyles, which we can use more often than not to help add information to a case. So I just wanna thank you all very much for uh, joining us today. It's been a real pleasure and I um, look forward to answering any questions anyone has. Um, if you ever do come across any leaf insects, I definitely highly recommend add those to iNaturalist. I will be happy to identify them for you. Or of course, you can email me with uh, any leaf insect questions. That's my research email. Or if you love seeing different bugs, check out my Instagram or uh, research gate. I'm always keeping those up to date with what I'm up to. So at this point, I am uh, done for what I have presented for you and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, um, Royce, for that uh, wonderful presentation. That's a great, great presentation. And I'm sure that uh, we will be having several uh, interesting questions from our, from our audience. And um, we have actually oh, we, a reminder to the audience, if you want to ask a live question, uh, click on the raise hand feature so that we can allow you to talk. Or if you want, uh, you could just put your text on the question and answer uh, feature. Okay, so let me just first. Okay, any questions from the from the audience? Uh, all right. So while they're uh, while they're still, let me check the Q and A. Okay, first question uh, from an anonymous attendee: Have you ever been in a crime scene with an actual body? How did you feel? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, while I was working on my master's in Indiana, thankfully, so forensic entomology, as I mentioned, is a very niche group. There's not very many people who do it. So I was very thankful that when I was doing my master's, one of the retired professors there was a forensic entomologist and he lived just down the road. So anytime he would get a called up for a case, he would call the master students and we would hop in the van and we would uh, drive on out to his farm and pick him up and he would guide us out to the case and we were his his slave labor for the day uh, learning on the scene while we go so yes we've uh, worked with a number of cases and uh, we also did autopsies every monday in southern indiana to uh, learn all the ins and outs of death and uh, death investigation so it's a very niche line of work and mm -hmm. very interesting because obviously 
every case is the same, uh, is, very, is very different. Nothing is the same day to day. So when you took your uh, master's in forensic entomology, did you also take uh, like courses uh, dealing with, you know, uh, medicine, like, uh, you know, uh, being able to do your autopsies? Are you permitted uh, specifically to do that? Uh, or do you just do your observations with the, with the coroner? So it is always a team effort. Whenever you are working an investigation, you have dozens and dozens of people involved from uh, everything from, you know, the fingerprint people to DNA to mm -hmm. trace evidence like uh, hair samples or fibers. And it's always a massive team effort. Uh, in the case of working our autopsies every Monday, we were working with an uh, incredibly brilliant pathologist. And so every autopsy that we worked on his job every time was to go through and look over the body and look for instances of uh, possible you know, heart failure, or we did have several murders that we investigated looking into uh, how these individuals had been killed. Um, also drug overdoses were very, very common in that area. So we had to deal with um, a lot of toxic uh, individuals and look at the, the lab results from those. Mm -hmm. So everything about death there's is very very interesting <laughs> aspects and, and very very tough it, it definitely takes some getting used to it's yeah. not it's not something you can walk in there and do the day at the very first day i think i almost fainted on my my first autopsy i had to sit down and then after a while it just gets so interesting and every case is so different that um you do get used to it after a while. Mm -hmm. Okay, a question from John David Indrika. Uh, do you have any tips for someone who might want to take up forensic entomology? Yes, so unfortunately there are not a whole lot of uh, in-person programs around mm -hmm. the world, but I think for most regions, you can generally find an active forensic entomologist. And the reason I actually got involved with this was because I had been working at a insect company, BioQuip, where they do nets and drawers. And um, I had just run into a forensic entomologist there. And mm -hmm. forensic entomologists are typically uh, some of the more friendly and more personable entomologists. I mean, there are very many entomologists who are very nerdy and only like their bugs. And they love to like lock themselves in the museum and mm -hmm. aren't very good to talking to people. But typically, I've found forensic entomologists are very, uh, very happy to share their information. And they're always looking for someone to take over when they want to retire. So uh, it's, I would recommend reaching out to anybody you can find, look through forensic investigation um, uh, articles and just see who's actively working in the field. Look for areas um, in your particular region where there might be a lack of information. Yeah. So, and there are a number of uh, online courses, I believe, I think the University of Arizona actually has a number of like online courses and they're trying to ramp that up a lot. I've got a number of colleagues out there who do a wonderful job. And um, I think there's a number of resources available through online for people to reach out and learn. All right, a question from Rod Sam Korch Kester Caparoso. Um, his question is, do you preserve insects that you get from the crime scene? Or is there a need for them to be preserved already? Yes, yes. So. The insects on the crime scene, as I've mentioned, they're evidence. They are very important to these cases more often than not. So when we either collect them ourselves or when we have someone on the scene collect it and send it to us, uh, most of the insects get preserved in alcohol. And every time we receive these insects, every vial will get labeled with an evidence number. And whenever these are changing hand, just mm -hmm. like any evidence in a crime scene, these have to go along with a, um, a full set of paperwork that yes, these are uh, going from one person to another and have that chain of custody. Otherwise uh, there can be issues in court. So it's it's treated just like bullets at a crime scene or anything else at a crime scene. They're, they're very helpful sometimes. Yeah. So can I do a follow-up question? Um, <laughs> you've said that it's uh, the insects are treated as part of the evidence. And, and when you, for example, preserve uh, specimens in ethanol, um, if the specimen uh, is transferred to another person or to another unit, how do you make sure that you know the, the specimen is still kept in, in good condition? Like 
uh, do you yourself put uh, the ethanol, you know, uh, from time to time, making sure that they are all submerged in that uh, formulation? Definitely. So when, because we work on such a big region, uh, I think here in uh, the West Coast of North America, I think there's only maybe four or five active forensic entomologists. So whenever we get called up for a scene, if we're not actually going out to the scene, we will then instruct someone there to collect it for us. So sometimes they don't have ethanol. Sometimes they have some rubbing alcohol in their truck. Mm -hmm. um, we've even had people send us insects in whiskey and vodka. And you know, it was the highest alcohol that they had, mm -hmm. but it's, it's good enough so that when they collect it, they can ship it to us overnight. Once we receive it, then I will log all the specimens, identify everything, and then I'll preserve them in 95%, you know, uh, museum grade alcohol in museum grade uh, vials so that this insect evidence uh, for years to come will be safe and will be uh, able to be re reinvestigated or investigated by a different forensic entomologist. So another question from John David Endriga, uh, do you deal with insect DNA and how do you use it in uh, forensics? So that has been, that's come up a little bit from time to time. Uh, most of the work we're dealing with is looking at the growth and development. But mm -hmm. of course, there are some insects that are a bit difficult to identify. So when we're looking at the insect DNA, typically that's when we have a, a mystery species. We're not exactly sure what species a particular maggot is. Uh, unfortunately, many maggots all look the same. They're kind of like babies. They're, they're very hard to tell apart. And uh, it's, it's, if it's a very important case and there's lots of questions that we aren't able to answer unless we know the species, in those cases, we can, we can do a quick barcode on the species to make sure we 100% identify it uh, correctly to make sure that from there on, that species will then guide the entire rest of the investigation. From Luis Calama, um, hi there, uh, may I ask if you have if we could have your reference or literature on the routes of colonization of leaf insects towards the Philippines. I think uh, probably you could just share a link later on if you have. Sure. So actually that will be coming soon. We uh, have just finished our large family-wide phylogeny and uh, that should be hopefully available in the next you know, three or four months. Uh, mm -hmm. At which point that'll be added on my research gate. And of course, if you just look up uh, phylogeny of leaf insects in a couple months once it's published it'll be the first one to pop up because this yeah, is okay. the first yeah. large-scale group that's been done on this particular group and uh, we look through the entire biogeography of the entire family so obviously the uh, philippines will be highlighted as a very beautiful diverse group but uh, once you have the entire family it's a lot easier to understand the routes of colonization so uh, make sure that you follow uh, Royce's uh, research gate account so that you will be notified when uh, that publication is already available. A question from Joko Prigiono. I, uh, how about cases on the corpses of uh, COVID-19 victims? Uh, have you seen any insect that, uh, you know, infest the corpse? That we've not had to have any issues with COVID-19 and insects. Um, usually our instances where we get called in are when someone's been dead for a couple of days and has just been found. So uh, typically if, um, you know, we might get called in for a case if uh, someone had just been found and happened to have COVID and died from that. But as far as directly related to most COVID cases, that's, that's usually a little more, everyone's on top of that and uh, in a hospital setting insects are not uh, not allowed in and not a not a common issue. So we have a lot of questions here. Um, we'll just answer first the ones that uh, deal with forensic entomology so that we can transition to sure. the leaf insects. Okay. So um, next question is, is forensic entomology harder in areas with higher diversity of insects? So unfortunately, there is a bit of a double-edged sort of a caveat with that. So mm -hmm. yes, it's more difficult because there's more species to work with. And then again, yes, it's more difficult because there's fewer forensic entomologists typically. 
um, with more species and in these very high diverse areas. Unfortunately, um, there is a lot that we don't know. So some of the areas where there's a lot of information and many forensic entomologists working like uh, Europe, Australia, uh, North America, um, we have a lot of great data sets. Most other regions of the world, there's just not as many people working on it. And there's so many questions that are unanswered that um, if we are presented with a case, uh, it would take a lot of work to be able to get a solid in, uh, line of evidence that'll stand up in court because uh, we have to know everything about those insects and the, the region that they are in and everything associated with their lifestyle. And that takes a lot of work up front and behind the scenes. Yeah. A follow-up question from John David Endriga. How long does evidence stay viable in alcohol? So it depends what you need to use it for. So typically, um, there's two different ways that I recommend people collect evidence and preserve it. If at some point you might need to use it for DNA analysis, such as identifying the DNA of the victim inside the crop of the insect, or uh, using the insect itself for DNA, you need to have at least 95% uh, alcohol to preserve the DNA well enough. Um, but more often than not, insects are very, very tough. Uh, that exoskeleton is very strong and it will last for a very long time. Uh, we have museum specimens that are three or 400 years old that have still survived the test of time and uh, many times less than ideal conditions. And insects are so tough that uh, if they are preserved you know, in a decent way, more often than not, they'll last for a very long time in evidence. It's only when you want to deal with DNA later that you have to really keep that uh, high quality uh, alcohol. So a question from Emmanuel Gandalera. Uh, is there a possibility that insect forensic evidences on crime scene can be tampered with? So I, that goes along with everything else in, in crime scenes, unfortunately. Just like any other evidence, if the, if things are not recorded and not kept track of, then that does present opportunity for things to be tampered with or lost or destroyed. So just like everything else, there's a chain of custody where if, um, if I am sent insect evidence, it'll be shipped via like FedEx or UPS somewhere where I have to sign for it to receive that yes, I, as a forensic entomologist, received this evidence. I have to log what I received. Uh, typically, everything gets photographed from beginning to end. So at the crime scene, uh, they'll take photographs of the insect evidence. And then uh, once I receive it, I'll also additionally, once I'm identifying it, I'll go through, give them my identification numbers, uh, photograph everything, so that if it does go to another forensic entomologist, they can then look back through my records, say, okay, you know, specimen number 645, Royce thought it was this species, I disagree. You know, I want to reference this particular species and say, ah, there's this specimen, say, ah, I disagree with Royce on this point, this point, this point. So just like everything, it's everything we keep as many records as possible, but it's only as good as people treated it as being. So it's it's a it's very important evidence and just like everything it's uh, we try to do our best to keep track of it okay. a question from erica says manuel was there a time when the information you have gathered or probably through experience uh gathered through forensic entomology failed to be compatible with other evidences in the body was there a time or was there a, a case like that Every now and then things like that will pop up. And uh, sometimes we are able to eventually figure it out. Uh, one particular, or two, I'll give you two examples that are interesting and thought provoking. The, this first one, the, uh, uh, the particular victim, when they recovered her body, they found that she had maggots feeding on the rest of her body. They looked to be about three days old, which made sense because she had last been seen at a gas station five days before. Mm -hmm. However, the insects in her nose looked to be about seven days old. So either she was walking around with maggots in her nose when she was still alive mm -hmm. or something else was going on. Uh, later, it was found out when people were being interviewed about this particular case, uh, she had been doing lots of cocaine and uh. cocaine actually speeds up insect development. So at first, when we saw that, we were thinking, 
wow, something's not adding up here. But once you know a little bit more of the chemistry behind it and um, different chemicals will actually have different development influences. So cocaine and heroin will speed up development. Uh, poisons such as arsenic will actually slow down development. So not only do we have to know a lot about the insects, we also have to work with the forensic pathologist and um, understand what chemicals were going on in the body. One other example of where things didn't line up perfectly um, and it took us a little bit of thinking to figure it out was uh, this was an individual who had uh, just, it was a murder suicide. So he had just killed somebody and then he took his own life. Mm -hmm. um, the individual who he had killed, he had killed indoors. So they had fallen, um, the whole house had been left open. So insects were able to come and go. However, when he killed himself, he had fallen dead next to an oak tree. So when we're looking at the insect evidence, the evidence for the individual inside looks to be several days older than the evidence on the body outside. Um, it wasn't until we actually went back to the crime scene later in the evening and noticed that there was a large ant's nest up in the tree. So ants, unfortunately, are our arch nemesis. They will walk out in the middle of night and they will steal maggots, they will steal eggs, mm -hmm. and they will actually rock away with our evidence. So in this particular case, it looked as though maybe uh, the first three or four days, the ants had come down every night, stolen all the evidence, and it wasn't until three or four days later where the maggots were actually able to keep hold. So every now and then things don't add up, but uh, there's there's so many little caveats to it with temperature, the fluctuations through temperature throughout the day, indoors versus outdoors, uh, direct temperature or direct sunlight versus a body of water in the shade. Lots of little things that you have to keep in mind and be able to work with. I see. So we have actually a master student working on identifying insects that can be found in carcasses, carcasses. and he's uh, he's trying to correlate the stages of insect development using DNA. Uh, do you have any tips on how to achieve this, especially now that we are in quarantine? <laughs> yeah, this, this quarantine is a perfect time to get research done. I definitely highly recommend it. Um, so that's a very interesting line of work. The, the epigenetics, so looking at what areas of the genome are active at certain life stages is one way to do that. Um, more often than not, the insects that we work with for forensics, they're pretty easy to identify what stages of growth. Um, but if you were working with, uh, for example, there's particular fish that they're not forensically significant, but if you want to know their age or what particular season they were collected in, you can look at those epigenetic markers to see which part of the DNA was most active at different particular times. So for the forensics worth work, more often than not, those life stages are very easy to identify morphologically, and you don't have to use any DNA for this particular case. But um, I could see how that could be used. It's just a lot more expensive and uh, a little more time consuming than just looking at the morphology sometimes. Okay, um, when you do forensic experiments, is it advisable for the body to be touching the ground or elevated? So it depends what you're working with. So uh, there's so many different instances of death, you know, the, the amount of bodies you find in odd places is ridiculous. You know, you'd always expect someone to be, you know, hidden under this or buried in the ground or um, every now and then you find bodies up in trees, you can find bodies in cars. So you have to be prepared and understand all these different con conditions. So there are a number of body farms. If you have not heard of a body farm, <laughs> I definitely recommend looking it up. Uh, not after you've had a meal though. It's mm -hmm. It's quite an intense place and there's a lot of very interesting research that happens there. But in those instances, they're trying to learn as much as they can from different situations where um, if a body has been wrapped up in a tarp, uh, how does that influence how quickly the insects can get to it versus a body sitting in a car or a, in a suitcase. Um, that all influences how the insects are able to work with uh, and also uh, how we as forensic entomologists are able to approach it. If it's a completely novel situation that has never been researched before, we might then have to go and recreate this particular instance in a field experiment using a, a pig body, as you saw in those earlier slides I showed. That's usually more often what's used 
to kind of recreate a human um, instance. So if it's something that has never been studied before, we might have to take a, uh, a cadaver and recreate those instances to try to learn from that. All right. A question from Lawrence Alamo. Uh, what are the common insects used in forensic entomology? How do you deal with the misconceptions about forensic entomology? So I'll start off with the, the misconceptions about forensic entomology. And we, we always chuckle at these because all of the uh, great crime scene TV shows that everyone loves to watch and uh, uh, Bones and investigation files and such, yeah. usually CSI. the forensic entomology, yeah, CSI, everyone, uh, they sometimes make it seem a little more uh, royal and elaborate and more exciting than our work usually is because usually mm -hmm. we're in there um, working with the very the really decomposed bodies but sometimes they present things in the tv shows that we cannot actually do I so it's, it's always fun uh talking with people and uh, trying to set them straight as far as what we can and cannot do and i think the first part of the question was what are the most common insects right yeah. and the the most common ones we work with are the flies and the beetles but more often than not, uh, because bodies are typically found rather quickly, um, you know, it's it's not if if someone has been really well hidden or is somewhere very remote, mm -hmm. typically you know, it might be a couple of years before someone's found. In which case, we're just looking at the fly puparia left behind in the soil. But more often than not, the main decomposers on uh, corpses are flies, and that's those active maggots. All right. So probably before we switch to the questions uh, concerning your leaf insects, I have a question. Um, forensic entomologists, you know, most probably non non-existent right now here in the Philippines. Probably we don't have an expert, or probably we have, but uh, you know, using forensic entomology per se in 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 uh, crime investigation, prob it's not um, that uh, established. Mm -hmm. And uh, while our neighbors at the South, uh, Southeast Asian region are slowly gaining uh, some headway in this field, all right, I think it was only around 2018 that uh, some, of, some entomologists were able to study uh, Philippine blowflies. Mm -hmm. Uh, which can be used for forensic entomology. And my question is, because uh, the Philippines is uh, an archipelago and some of these blowflies may be or may not be present in some of our islands, what do you suggest? Can you, you know, uh, what remedies can you suggest to, to avert the potential problems in escalating the field of forensic entomology in the Philippines? So one of the great ways to actually get started in the field of forensic entomology is to just start to know what's in your local area. So uh, I recommend people set out, um, you know, a piece of chicken or something and just start recording what species they're finding. If you get to the point in your career where you want to uh, have your first publication or enter a field of publications you've never tried before, I highly recommend uh, looking into forensic entomology and starting to record what species are in your particular areas, what times of year. Um, if you set up a uh, trap, you can trap species regularly and identify that. And that's all incredibly value information that then either can assist in a forensic investigation or at some point be used down the line. But uh, on the flip side of that, if you do have an area that has not been investigated yet and there is not a forensics presence, um, have no fear. You can always do this after the fact. Uh, if you do have a body that's uh, uh, it's located and they do collect insect evidence from it, you can always go back to the scene, recreate, you know, do a, an experiment at the scene later in the area, uh, put out uh, some meat, put out a cadaver, and then you can learn from it after the fact. It doesn't have to be all before uh, an individual is collected. It can, all, it can always be going back to it later and uh, gathering your information from that area because no one, no one expects everyone to have all the information all the time in this particular line of work. It's a lot of holes in our knowledge and very often we have to uh, uh, look back in the literature and if there's nothing, then we have to do it ourselves. 
All right, we'll be shifting our questions to leaf insects. So uh, from an attendee about the leaf insects, do they adjust coloration like mimicking decaying leaves or are their colorations uh, fixed? So that is actually a super exciting question, which I'm working on right now in my PhD. We're actually looking at the, the phytochemical basis of their coloration. And it's a lot more interesting than we thought it was. Um, I should have pulled up, added a slide in, but mm -hmm. certain species, when you change their host plant or you adjust the humidity or um, different factors like that, throughout time, they will actually be able to change their color. Um, that's true for many different phasmids. Um, it's a really neat adaptation. If you're trying to look like a leaf changing through the seasons, or you get knocked off your host plant and you have to start feeding on something else, you don't want to stand out. So you have to be able to adjust. And um, there are a number of species where we've been able to observe that chemical change and the adjustment of their coloration. So like I said, they've got the coloration, they've got the shape, they've got the movement, they got the texture. The leaf insects are very, very impressive camouflage. But how about the morphological change? Have you observed them also? So the morphological change that is more fixed, mm -hmm. um, going from life stage to life stage, such as the nymph uh, to a later stage, they will grow obviously, but then they can kind of adjust the shape. Some species um, can be very diverse in their shape. Actually, a species out in Palawan, Phylum gantengens, uh, it can go from a, it can have species or specimens that are tapered to boxy, to extremely lobed, all within a single species. So it's we're not 100% sure as to um, how they determine if this is a, a genetic predisp predisposition to their what shape they're going to end up. But once they've reached that shape, that shape is fixed. It's fixed. just then the coloration after that they can adjust. So yeah, once they've reached that final life stage, that's what they're stuck with, unless, of course, something nibbles on them. Every now and then you'll see a leaf insect with a bite mark out of it, uh, ah. just like a leaf. Okay, uh, a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, are there distinct features or characteristics you usually see among the tropical leaf insects only? Hmm, so The, the leaf insects, they can range from way out in Fiji all the way up into Tibet. So there is a quite a massive range in as far as the ecologies of these different regions. We've been trying to look at some of these morphological differences between, say, a high elevation species in Tibet versus a high elevation species in Philippines. And nothing we've seen so far correlates or stands out really easily as a, um, a unique feature for tropical versus more temperate. Um, but right now what we have found and which has been really interesting is from our large scale molecular phylogeny, it looks as though when the leaf insects first originated, they exploded in diversity. They had a very quick rapid diversification into many different genera. And then in the last 40 million years, they've been more slowly diversifying and slowly adjusting that shape. So um, a long time ago, we had quite the diversity of shapes that really um, adjusted themselves and were quite different. And then things have been a little more steady in the last 40 million years, as far as just slight adjustments to that perfect leaf camouflage. A uh, question from Wayne Francis Regis, are leaf insects specific to their host plants to effectively camouflage? If they are, does that mean endemic plants or tree species may likely correspond to a specific species of leaf insect? So that is something that we're looking into and I can give you a quick hint right now. Uh, it's they're not specific. Mm -hmm. um, the, we've been recording every host plant record we can find, uh, giving them different species in captivity. Every time someone records something in the wild, I always try to identify species as it turns out, they're quite generalist feeders. They will eat on, I think, nine different orders of plants mm -hmm. uh, across a whole variety of different families and different chemical compositions. And uh, it doesn't look like there's any, any yet that are very much mimicking a specific plant. But bit by bit, we're starting to unravel some of the specific, uh, possibly native plants. Unfortunately, 
many of the leaf insects we find them on, they're feeding on guava or uh, guava. some other mango. Uh, non yeah, guava, mango, they're feeding on something that might not have been native to that area, but is now diverse across all of Asia. So uh, sometimes there, there might be a very unique host plant that they evolved alongside, but more often than not, it looks like they will feed on a, a, a variety of plants. Question from Joaquim de Sena, are stick insects and leaf insects related? Yes, so the leaf insects are a subordinate group. So they're actually nested within the stick insects. So stick insects have quite a diversity. They can look like moss or lichen or thin sticks or big chunky pieces of bamboo, you know, just a beautiful diversity of camouflage patterns in there. Um, but only once has this really uh, thin bodied leaf insect mimic uh, originated. There's a couple other kind of a broad or uh, longer leaf mimics, like some uh, eucalyptus leaf mimicking stick insects in Australia, or some very large, thick green leaf mimicking insect stick insects in Malaysia. But all of those have a very thick body. Their camouflage is all on the exter exterior. Leaf insects have the outside of their abdomen flattened so that light can pass through them and really perfect that leaf mimicry. So there are a couple other leaf mimics in the stick insects, but this particular family has that uh, very unique uh, abdomen shape and uh, femoral lobes that really perfect that leaf mimicry. So they do it the best, I would I would argue, <laughs> all the leaf, leaf mimics out there. And by the way, how do you collect the leaf insects? Are there uh, special techniques like traps uh, or chemicals? Or do, I wish. Do you just, do you, just <laughs> you know, um, rely on your eyes? So some of the, the best ways to find them, uh, as some of those males I showed you, those actually do have flight wings. Males will occasionally fly to lights at night. So if you do have a big moth light out or you're driving by a gas station and they got all their lights on, uh, every now and then you will find male leaf insects out there. Um, as I mentioned, the females are way up in the canopy. It's very difficult to find those. I always recommend going right out after a storm if you're looking down low. And then the last tip is uh, go out at night. So uh, because stick insects are more or less nocturnal, there'll be a lot more movement and activity in the evening. And one thing that's really neat is the leaf insect camouflage has been perfected for daylight. It's so that as the, the sun passes through them, they look exactly like a leaf from below. Mm -hmm. But at night, when there's no back backlighting, if you shine a flashlight on them, they actually stand out pretty brightly against their backdrop. So if you want to see them a lot more easily, I definitely recommend uh, looking for them with lights at night. Also looking in disturbed areas. So unfortunately, if you are in a beautiful, pristine forest full of diversity, they're going to be way up in the canopy and you're very unlikely to find them. If you go through an area that has been uh, disturbed in the last couple of years or is um, uh, if you have private property that backs up to beautiful nature reserves. If someone has a mango tree in their backyard, check it out. Uh, it's usually a little bit shorter and easier to see the top of those trees. Um, but more often than not, we rely on luck. So as I mentioned, museums are our beautiful repository of information. And all of these insects that have been found in museums, I love looking through the historic ones and looking at who collected them. Um, I will often find uh, ornithologists or you know, bird people have collected specimens or grasshopper people or people who are out there looking for rocks even. Uh, if someone comes across <laughs> a leaf insect, they generally think it's cool enough that they will save it and they will bring it back to the museum. And then uh, it gets left there until I find it someday. So it's, uh, it's a whole variety of people and a lot of luck. After hundreds of years of collecting, museums generally have uh, a decent collection, but as far as me going out and trying to find them, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it takes <laughs> takes a long time. Yeah. How about baits? Um, do you can you use baits, chemical baits? So we might be able to someday when mm -hmm. we figure out what pheromones the males are attracted to, because they've got those big bushy antenna. Um, obviously, the males have a hard time finding the ladies up in the canopy as well. Uh, it's hard to find a single leaf in a tree, so. There is definitely some uh, chemical cues that the females are releasing to lure in the males, but 
Uh, there's been very little research done yet on leaf insects and uh, their biochemicals. So unfortunately, um, we have no idea what particular chemicals might lure in a male yet. No one, no one has found any for me. If someone does, let me know, please. Okay, from Jerby and uh, Basilio, have you ever studied leaf insects just by basing on photographs? If so, how do you deal with this limitation? So uh, actually we dealt with a number of really neat ones in our most recent cryptophilium paper. In that paper, we looked across uh, I think 20 something species across a massive geographic range from uh, India and Tibet all the way through to the Philippines and down in Indonesia. And of course, there were many instances where I've only seen a photograph on iNaturalist or only seen a couple pictures that somebody sent me. In those cases, there's not much that we can do as far as uh, describing the species or um, identifying a whole lot from those. Uh, sometimes we don't know what the males look like because we only get sent a female picture or we don't know what the eggs look like and that might make it difficult to exactly locate where they might be related to others. But as far as just working with photographs, uh, we every now and then we'll include unidentified material in publications just to say, hey, look at this beautiful example. This helps to clarify a particular area of our range. For example, the cryptophilium, up until a month before we published, I had never seen a cryptophilium in the Philippines. And then uh, two popped up on iNaturalist. And there we had uh, our first records for the Philippines and had never been seen before there. So we included those pictures. We reached out to the uh, photographers and asked them for more information. And uh, we were able to include those pictures just as a, observ a photographic record. So. We always love seeing the live leaf insects. It's so much more fun seeing them live in their beautiful natural state than uh, preserved in a collection, generally because they lose their color. And it's, it's not as fun to see them beautiful and live in a tree. But um, so we always love receiving live images of, in, of individuals, even if we can't identify it or uh, can't uh, include it uh, for much more. Uh, we can't do any DNA analysis, obviously, from it. But the more information we have, the better fuller story we can present. A question from Darrell Acuna. How do phylum differ from other leaf insect genera? What morphological characters do these, uh, does this uh, uh, genus species uh, differ? Mm -hmm. One of the big features that has really separated these out from the rest of the stick insects and some other leaf mimics is that really thin abdomen and that thin exoskeleton that uh, they have that beautiful coloration of green, and it's set up that as the light passes through, they blend right into that canopy. So um, it's definitely that, that adaptation to have that very thin exoskeleton on each side of their body that has separated them out from all other leaf mimics and allowed them to diversify to look like any broad leaf plant. And they've uh, obviously expanded across many reason, regions of Asia. So, and in your experience in identifying leaf insects, what could be the most important morphological characters that you should look for in order to identify and classify them? Um, would sending a photograph uh, be enough to identify these leaf so, insects? More often than not, yes. If it's a dorsal picture, so if you're looking at the leaf insect flat, uh, I can very often tell you just from looking at the the veins in the wing, and also looking at the shape of the abdomen and the shape of the legs. More often than not, just a single dorsal picture is good enough and knowing where it came from, of course. If you tell me which islands uh, and seeing that general shape, I can more often than not tell you the species. Once you get into um, trying to learn more about their morphology and really understand uh, some of the more fine details, some really cool features we've been looking at are the eggs. Um, just the uh, last couple of years, we started to look at the egg morphology and how drastically different it is. And for some reason, um, almost every species has a unique egg as well. So eventually I'll be able to make a key to species just based on the egg morphology and the freshly hatched nymph. Uh, when those nymphs first hatch from the egg, uh, typically they're brown, black, or red, and they uh, will then run to a tree run up the tree and then they'll start to turn green. And at which point they all look very similar. 
but um, that first fresh coloration, that is also pretty unique to each species. And we're going through right now and photographing every species we can, their freshly hatched nymph. And we have a, a scientific illustrator who's actually going through and illustrating every species side by side. So one day we'll be able to do a big poster of all the uh, freshly hatched nymphs of the leaf insects. So people, even if they only see a nymph and it's only a day old, they'll still be able to ident identify it. So a question from Christian Flo Ryan Pratama. Uh, is there any possibility that the genus Cryptophyllum, Microphyllum, and Pseudomicrophyllum can be found on the islands of Borneo and Sulawesi? Or the four genera can only be found in the Philippines? Uh, are they endemic? So at this point, there are a couple endemic genera to the Philippines. The Microphyllum and Pseudomicrophyllum. We only know of them in northern Luzon and they've not been found anywhere else in the world. So yeah, we have two genera that are endemic to the Philippines, and then a lot of species that are endemic, of course. But as far as Cryptophyllum, uh, that has a very massive range. That's been a very successful and very uh, diverse species. That can be found from Southern Philippines into Indonesia and all up through mainland Asia. Okay, uh, I have a question. Um, what is your opinion on the trade of uh, leaf insects and uh, stick insects or other exotic animals uh, and its effects to conservation and biodiversity from the perspective of a receiving country and mm -hmm. a country that is actually sending the live specimens? So that I think in the last uh, maybe only in the last 30, 40 years have countries started to realize how important a lot of their biodiversity is and have just slowly started, in many cases, slowly started to work on regulating uh, livestock trade as far as uh, live species and uh, specimens being exported. More often than not, the specimens that we see in museums and in collections were actually in, uh, were being raised by somebody. So actually in a commercial environment, um, uh, there's a really, really interesting photos I've seen of people who have made these massive, like, a, you know, a, maybe like 10 meter tall cages where they've got tons of host plants up inside them. And that's their, their breeding facility for all these leaf insects. And they're able to uh, raise these in massive quantities just from uh, a, a single female because she left, say, several hundred eggs in her lifetime. So it's uh, very similar to the uh, live butterfly trade, which the Philippines is a, a beautiful hot spot of diversity for butterflies as well. And uh, a, a major exporter uh, to many of the butterfly exhibits around the world. So lots of uh, permitting to be involved with that. Mm -hmm. And um, the countries need to be aware that um, this, this is a very interesting uh, set of insects. And so there are a lot of people who are interested in collecting them and also uh, for, I think, Many get used for artwork, and so it is, I think, as far as ecologically, it's a lot, obviously, a lot more val uh, viable and a lot better for the environment if someone is uh, keeping a cage of them and re raising those for exportation, uh, just like a live butterfly exhibit, versus uh, going out and continually collecting from the forest, which mm -hmm. is not sustainable and um, can, can be very valuable to find that unknown biodiversity, but is uh, very, obviously it's, it's not, not the best practice. How about invasiveness? Um, do you consider, would you consider that um, trading these uh, leaf insects uh, would probably result to a bioinvasion later on? In some cases, I would definitely say there's there's mm -hmm. very likely. Uh, I think actually in Bali, Indonesia, there have mm -hmm. been um, a number of instances where leaf insects were brought in for a live, live butterfly exhibit. Mm -hmm. And I think a typhoon came through and uh, destroyed the exhibit. And now there's several species of leaf insects that we don't think were native to there and mm -hmm. uh, probably are now. And um, because leaf insects are somewhat generalists as far as feeding, I definitely think there's the uh, possibility of invasive species in some instances. Yeah. And hopefully that um, does not become an issue. But as of right now, it's, it seems as though it's very limited. Limited. So 
there's a low chance of it being like a, a pest, potential pest in the future. What would you say about that? As, as far as compared to some other stick insects, um, mm -hmm. there have been some stick insects that have become global pests and you can find them all around the world and uh, will be extreme generalists where they will feed on absolute any plant. The leaf insects are a little bit lower as far as uh, invasive capabilities because they do need a slightly more particular humidity, temperatures, um, some host plants they will not accept. So I'd probably say they're more middle ground. They're not the extreme uh, insects that might uh, wipe out an ecosystem, but there are many instances where they could probably become invasive in an area. All right, great. So we'll just be throwing one last uh, question for Royce to, to answer. Unfortunately, we cannot um, uh, try to accommodate everything. Uh, we still have around six more questions, but uh, we suggest that uh, probably you could drop uh, drop a question to Royce's email or probably just uh, through your social media so you could talk more. Sure, anytime. Okay. Always yeah, right. happy to talk insect. Okay. Uh, last question from Kathleen Baraan. Having mentioned most people who delve into the world of entomology, uh, they end up where the money is. What message do you impart to those who aspire to take the same field such as yours? Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually recommend, recommend diversifying. So just as I did, I dabble in many different insect worlds. Uh, I've mentioned briefly the live butterfly exhibits as well. Um, if you're going to go into one of those niche entomology regions that does not have as much money and is not as well known, I recommend diversifying uh, so that you can always uh, be relevant and always find some more work to do and always get called up for different projects. Um, otherwise, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you're going to have to resort to uh, big ag because mm. agriculture is where the money is at and pest management and uh, working with invasive species and uh, human pests such as mosquitoes and vectors. Yeah. So if, if you want to go into the more niche, I say, well, actually, I've heard a lot of cases of uh, people who work in ag and then they do a little bit of something on the side for fun that they are really passionate about, like the systematics or taxonomy or uh, working with some oddball group of insects. But I either diversify or have a nest egg and work work for ag and do this for fun on the side. Yeah. So um, thank you very much, Royce, for that very interesting presentation. I'm sure that uh, a lot of our audience will be contacting you through your email or your social media accounts. So. I am sure that they are interested to know more about forensic entomology, especially, you know, that kind of field is uh, probably in the birthing pains here in the Philippines right now. There are very few entomologists who are actually going there or studying forensics for that matter. Um, forensics as a field, you know, here in the Philippines is just starting and, uh, you know, using the DNA laboratory, uh, we, I think we've only have around two or three forensic experts here in the Philippines right now. Okay. It means lots to learn and lots of opportunity. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's a whole world out there of information that uh, I hope people will get more excited about and involved in. I always yeah. try to make sure that when people are leaving my talks about forensics, that they're a little bit more excited about the insects around them and all that we can learn. So uh, I thank everyone for attending today, and I, I'm always happy to answer more questions. Yeah, so shout out to all those buddy entomologists right out okay. there. Um, make sure that you, you know, uh, consider forensic entomology in the future, right? Okay. So um, before we end our program, let me just uh, uh, thank Royce for accepting our invitation to talk. And uh, we are very grateful for this uh, topic that you have uh, presented here and we are uh, we will be issuing you a virtual certificate of recognition it's just for tradition and um, before that make sure that you are able to click on the link that I have uh, put out there in the 
in the chat box. It's the link to the virtual uh, to the online evaluation form. Make sure that you answer it because it will be uh, it's our system of uh, issuing our certificate of attendance. So make sure that you click on that and um, put out your information there. Evaluate our SEP webinar. Let me just um, share my screen. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Museum of Natural History, Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension here at UP Los Banos, College Laguna, we are awarding this certificate of recognition to Royce Cumming for serving as our resource person during this uh, 2021 MH Biodiversity Seminar entitled The Multidisciplinarity of Insects Within the Sciences from Solving Crimes to Answering Evolutionarily Significant Questions. So held today, March 19, 2021, from 10 to 11.30 morning, Philippine Standard Time via Zoom. And in witness whereof, the signature of our director, Dr. Marian P. De Leon, is here unto a fixed. Thank so, you very much. I, I look forward to visiting in the future. As soon yes, as the please do ready, so. I, I will soon be as, there. As yeah, soon as this <laughs> pandemic is over, you are free. Please go come here to the to UP Los Banos and visit our museum. So make sure that you are able to um, evaluate our, our webinar. Uh, you can also go to bit.ly slash 2021-bss-eval. We will accept responses only until 3 p.m. today. Uh, do visit our website at mnh.uplb.edu.ph or drop us an email at mnh.uplb at up.edu.ph. We are in Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and Instagram. Just look for the handle UPLB Museum and check out our articles at uh, Wikipedia and TripAdvisor. So maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thank you, Royce, for uh, being our... Uh, speaker for today. Next week, we will have two webinars. It's on uh, Philippine time. It's It will be on Monday and Tuesday. And we hope that every one of you can join us again uh, during the Museums Biodiversity Webinar Series. So maraming salamat po. Take care of yourselves and good luck. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much, Royce. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody.